1 Peter, right? Yep, 1 Peter. <laughs> I had it here. There it is, it's a page here. The second chapter, verses 2 through 10. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by them you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, and a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they are destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Here ends the reading of our scripture. here uh, and I was really hoping it was for the children's message and that you guys weren't just trying to tell me something so I, I'm glad that that's what it was for yeah that will tell my back yeah thank you so in our scripture uh, for today we find Peter putting forth a few different ideas for us in this short uh, bit of scripture there's so many things that are there um, so he puts forth that we need to be fed sp uh, spiritual milk to be a living stone, reminding us that we're part of a royal priesthood and that we're God's own people. And finally, he tells us that we have been given mercy. There's a lot to unpack there in just that short bit of scripture. And I think that when we study passages like this, we can almost become overwhelmed by all the different thoughts and ideas that the writer is giving to us. Now, if you're a person that likes to visualize what you read, then something like this probably has your mind going in a hundred different directions as you're trying to read it and take it all in. I want you to try and think back to when you first came to Christ, to the time in your life when you first really began to study and read scripture. Did it all feel a bit overwhelming to you then? See, oftentimes when we reach a certain level of being able to do something, we can forget that we struggled at the beginning of doing it. When I think about my own life, um, if I had a soccer ball and the right pair of shoes, I could probably keep it up in the air at least 50 times if I'm having a good run. Um, and that wouldn't be a problem for me now. But when I first started, I was lucky to get two. Uh, and, and you forget that once you gain uh, the ability to do something that you struggled to do it in the first place. And when you look at others, uh, when they are struggling at the beginning of their walk with Christ, and we wonder, why are you struggling to get this? Why can't you seem to get to the same level that we're at when it comes to this? Now, this will come as no major shock to any of you, but I am admittedly not a mechanically inclined person. I do not have the patience or the skill set to really do anything when it comes to working on a car. I can change a tire, I can pull a battery and put a new one in, and if I was really pressed, I could probably change the oil. The oil. But as a man, there is a thought that others have about me simply because I'm a man, that for some reason I must know a lot about cars. Now, I was recently meeting with the person, and they were looking over a vehicle that I, I'm hoping to sell. And it was clear to me right away when I met the man 
this is a car guy. See, he was looking over the vehicle with a fine tooth comb. He knew what areas on that particular year of the, of the car would be problematic. And so he was really looking at those parts. And then he fired up the engine and listened to it. And as he was doing so, he looked at me and he asked, do you know if this engine's ever been rebuilt? I said, well, no, I don't. However, I can assure you it hasn't been since I've owned it. And as he continued to check it out, he said, huh, it sounds like there might be a misfire in this engine. Can you hear that? And I looked at him and said, I, I guess so. Um, more of a question than a definitive statement to that I had heard it. And I could tell pretty quickly I was not impressing him with my knowledge of cars. Maybe you found yourself in a situation like that in your own life, right? Someone's talking to you about something that they know a lot about and you don't. More often than not, what's your response? It's just, oh, okay, or yeah, sure. See, he could have said to me, you know, I think I hear a slight ting in the coil pack and it might just be that the spark plug on cylinder seven has a little bend in it. And I would have heard him say something like this, you know, I think there's a mollywop in the doodad, and I think it's because the phalange is a little bit cattywampus. That's what it would have sounded like to me. And I would have simply said to him, yeah, sure, you got it. Now, it's not a big deal that I don't know a lot about cars after I'm not a car guy, and I am certainly not a mechanic, right? You wouldn't expect me to be able to fix something that I don't have the knowledge to be able to do. And I have to say, I do appreciate uh, the interaction I had with this person. Uh, he, once he treated, the way he treated me once he knew that I had no idea what he was talking about. Um, and I wasn't on the same level of knowledge that he was. You see, he was very kind about it. Uh, often when someone is skilled in an area though, they take on an air of superiority when, some, when they are meeting someone who is not skilled in the same way. You know, he could have said, you, you can't hear that misfire, what are you, deaf? It's clear as day. You can't tell the engine's been worked on. You can't see that the one bolt there is turned a quarter turn from the others. It's clear that someone had removed it at some point. But he didn't treat me like that at all. He even tried to explain to me what he was seeing in the vehicle and told me, don't worry about it. Everything I'm telling you is not a big deal and it can easily be fixed by someone who can do this work. But sometimes I think that we as Christians can take the wrong attitude when it comes to people that aren't as experienced in the faith. We almost come across at times like this. What do you mean you don't know what the Great Commission is? How do you not know who Obadiah was? And how can you not tell me what Matthew chapter 29 verse 5 says? Now, if you're thinking, well, it says nothing because Matthew ends in chapter 28. That's good, but that's also what I'm talking about here. You see, what we that have been members of the faith for a long time, we have to make sure that we're not allowing ourselves to become arrogant in our own skill set. As Peter put it in our scripture for today, we all start out like newborn infants, longing for the pure spiritual milk so that we can grow into salvation not born into salvation. We are not experts from the moment we begin our studies. We need to be fed good spiritual milk in order to grow. It's true for us when we first accepted Jesus, and it's true for someone else that is just now accepting Jesus. As I thought more about this this week, I was reminded of a story that one of my classmates told us at local pastor school. You see, in his church, before he had decided to become a pastor, there was a new pastor that had been appointed, and he was ready to give his first sermon to the church, and he was super excited about it. It was his first sermon that he was ever going to give at his first appointment since he had graduated from seminary. And he gave a rousing 30-minute sermon, and he felt that he had been doing so well because he looked out into the audience and everyone was just captivated by the words that he was saying. They were actively listening to what he was giving to them. After services, he had arranged to meet with the staff parish relations committee over lunch to discuss how his first sermon went. And he just knew that they were going to heap praises upon him for the diligent work that he had done in bringing them the word that week. So as they began to eat, he asked the members 
to tell him what they thought of his sermon. Which, by the way, is a dangerous question for a pastor to ever ask anyone uh, at any point. But he said, hey, did you all enjoy the sermon today? I worked really hard on it. You know, I looked out there and I could just see how everyone was so into it. And I know that I must have touched some people out there today. And the SPRC members looked at one another. And finally, someone spoke up and they said no. He said, what do you mean, no? He said, no, we didn't enjoy the sermon today. In fact, we have no idea what you were talking about up there today. If your goal was to show us all in the church how smart you are and how well you studied the verse this week, then you did that. Because we can all admit that you're probably the smartest person in the church. But none of us were able to take anything away from what you said because we couldn't even understand the words that you were using. You see, the pastor had gotten so wrapped up in writing and giving a sermon that was uh, up to his own academic standards, he had forgotten that he was supposed to be giving one that would serve as spiritual milk for his people. He had gotten so wrapped up in showing them how smart he was, that he, had, he had missed the point of what he was doing entirely. And I think sometimes we do that as Christians as well. We forget that others might not be as far along on their journey as we are. We expect them to be able to do and to understand things that we understand without making sure that they have those foundations to build upon first. In our scripture for today, we're told that Jesus is our cornerstone, the one that we are to build upon and that we are to be living stones. We are there to help add other living stones to that great structure that is to become the royal priesthood. Now, it's really hard to add other stones to the pile and to the structure when we might be looking down as others as not being worthy of added to the pile. See, we need to make sure that we are doing our best to help people better understand the word of God. Not from the standpoint of showing off our own superiority, but just from the standpoint of wanting to help others be fed spiritually. We have to remind ourselves that we are not the ones that choose which stones are added. We are only the ones that are to help carry those stones and then God will decide which ones are added. We need to be doing this, as Peter said, so that others may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light, so that they can receive the mercy where we once received mercy. Now, our work as Christians is clear here. We are to be rocks that can be built upon. The cornerstone has already been laid, and that is Jesus Christ. But we need to be ones that can also be built upon and ones that are allowing others to come and be added, not ones that are refusing to let the master build upon them. So let us commit ourselves to being those types of stones today's, today. My challenge for you this week is this. Reach out to someone in the spirit of humbleness and ask how you can help them grow in Jesus Christ. Amen.